to the webinar on the protection and compensation of victims and sanctions against perpetrators of violence and harassment. So this is the, the fifth webinar in the frame of our multi-sectoral social dialogue project on the role of social partners in preventing third party violence in the workplace. And before starting, I know you're all familiar by now uh, with uh, online meetings. I will nevertheless share a couple of housekeeping rules so that we can run our seminar smoothly. And maybe I should just start again and say, good morning. Uh, my name is Susan Flocken. I'm the European Director of ETUCE, and I'm very happy to be chairing this meeting today. We have indeed interpretation available in Bulgarian, English, French, Hungarian, and Italian. So please make sure your microphone is muted when you are not talking. I'll make sure to give everybody the floor. But, uh, and when you take the floor, please identify yourself. So let us know your name and organization and uh, indicate which language you will be speaking so that the interpretation can start a little faster. And while speaking, do try to not speak too fast and take the interpretation in account so that we can all understand each other well. So colleagues, I see that uh, some of um, you are connected and have already also adapted uh, your backgrounds to indeed the very serious and challenging, challenging situation that we're facing in Europe which we're undergoing at the moment with the situation between the Ukraine and Russia and the war that is going on in the Ukraine. And I think we extend also from our meeting, especially as we're talking about violence and harassment, our solidarity wishes to the people, to the colleagues in the Ukraine who are undergoing this very, very difficult um, moment and facing, facing that violence. Now, taking the multi-sectoral guidelines as our starting point for today's webinar, we will be looking at the best way to protect and compensate victims of violence and harassment from third party. So besides the prevention and risks assessment, compensation and protection of victims are crucial in the fight against violence and harassment in general. Case law and legislation are still lagging behind on this matter. Partners in different sectors have a important role to play in this discussion. And that is why we're meeting here today um, to put that forward. I'll just add that indeed the concept of third party um, from experience is a concept that um, is challenging at times to understand what is the third party. Um, and so it's very important indeed that we're taking this discussion today here regarding the compensation of victims and sanctions against the perpetrators. And I will now hand on to Rossella Benedetti for a couple of welcoming remarks. Um, she is the chair of the Standing Committee for Equality um, of ETUCE, European Trade and Committee for Education. And she will be giving you a greeting. Rosella, I pass the floor to you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, very important and timely uh, webinar. Uh, we will discuss violence. My heart is full of grief, as it is the heart of all Italians for the situation in Ukraine. And, and we stand uh, and solidarity with our Ukrainian, uh, of course, uh, colleagues, uh, all of Europe is standing in solidarity with them. And uh, of course, we are strongly supporting uh, the conclusion stopping of all conflicts uh, uh, and uh, peace uh, keeping uh, in that area. Uh, well, uh, as Susan has said, I'm the chair of the Standing Committee for Equality. The Standing Committee for Equality has always been uh, uh, committed to uh, any actions and any initiatives that uh, can make uh, 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 the personnel uh, situation, uh, the education personnel situation easier and the work also uh, easier in, in schools and uh, educational institutions at all levels. And of course, as a, a committee, as uh, an advisory committee to the to c committee, we've been working uh, for a long time now on the issue of violence, the issue of violence and third party violence in schools and educational institutions is uh, uh, an important one. We are very, well, very, very aware uh, of this challenge and we've been discussing it since 2008. Our first project started already at that time uh, dealing with uh, uh, with, with uh, tackling uh, gender violence and the harassment at school. And uh, since that time, we've been working very hard. We have produced uh, uh, some policy document. We have produced an action plan. And also, uh, our uh, work has expanded in uh, providing uh, advice uh, to other initiatives uh, um, made by A2C, initiatives uh, that uh, regards, of course, health and safety at work, which is an issue very important for us. Uh, we always uh, say that uh, uh, schools and educational institutions should be a safe haven for everyone, uh, students and workers uh, at the same time. But unfortunately, unfortunately, it isn't so. And it, uh, during uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, we've been, uh, uh, we have received news of increasing violence, increasing uh, an increasing number of uh, violence uh, cases uh, regarding the education personnel and students, even uh, with uh, uh, distance uh, teaching uh, when uh, uh, violence uh, should have been uh, the least of our worries or our concerns. And of course, we also have contributed, uh, teachers have contributed to um, uh, a cross-sectoral statement, uh, a statement uh, uh, drafted by social partners, namely uh, EPSU, SESI, and CEMR uh, last November regarding on the, on the day, celebrating the National Day, celebrating uh, uh, the fight against violence. Uh, and that was, uh, uh, let's say, a very important uh, uh, statement because it was meant to um, advocate for a quick reaction from uh, 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 EU and from uh, EU Commission, uh, the European Commission, but also from other uh, decision-making bodies in order to have a proper and very clear and effective legislative uh, uh, measure against violence, which we are still waiting for. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the European Commission hasn't uh, uh, so far um, 
fulfilled, fulfilled uh, the uh, commitment uh, that they have declared, that they have made public uh, in the framework of the renewal of the health and safety uh, legislation and uh, strategy for the next uh, uh, six years. If I recall it well, well, uh, what we we have done also what, one of the, the the specific output of uh, our action as a standing committee for equality, it's our uh, action plan on gender equality, which has a specific section, a specific chapter dealing with gender-based violence and harassment. And I invite you all uh, uh, to visit the HUC website and to look for this action plan. Uh, which has been translated in many different languages so far. And there we, we commit ourselves, so we commit our, um, as uh, national members and international organization, European organization, to act in order to end gender-based violence at work, especially in schools. So I think that, uh, uh, and also we, we have committed ourselves to push for the ratification uh, process of the uh, ILO convention uh, number uh, 190, uh, when uh, at the time and because of uh, the uh, lack of prompt reaction from many countries, European countries, we know that so far only two European countries have ratified this convention. And the ratification is only the first step uh, because then countries have to integrate it in their uh, legislation. So we still, we are waiting, uh, we are waiting from, uh, for a choral reaction from many countries uh, uh, that should be, I mean, this should be uh, uh, the basics of uh, our society. Uh, and we see that we need it. We see it that we need it, especially now, to react against violence, to do everything is possible, uh, especially starting from the workplaces, but also in society, in society at large, to react against violence and to prevent it, to make it possible to live without violence. So with that, uh, I close my intervention. I thank you again for inviting me and let me speak and uh, uh, say something about the, the, the work, the big work, because I have to say that HUC has always been working on this issue uh, with member states, with member organizations, and also in uh, uh, through the advocacy action at uh, uh, European level with all the uh, European institutions and organizations that are responsible for uh, gender issues and uh, for make it our uh, places safer for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosella, uh, for your uh, greetings and your introductory remarks. It was very um, helpful and, and enlightening. And I will now um, uh, invite Jane, Dr. Jane Pillinger, um, to uh, join us um, for a recap of the webinar, of the fourth webinar on digitalization. Um, Jane uh, is the project consultant. Uh, she's a global expert on gender equality and gender-based violence at work. Um, she's got an academic background in social policy and as an activist uh, for ending gender-based violence and she's been working for that for more than 35 years. She's given policy advice to social partners, companies, governments, and European and international organizations. And she's the author of several books and numerous articles on the topic. She's acted as an expert to the ILO during the negotiations for the ILO Convention 190. And Jane is also the co-author of a book that's just been published uh, this week by Agenda Publishing, Stopping Gender-Based Violence and Harassment in the World of Work, the campaign for an ILO convention. 
and she is currently visiting professor at the Department of Criminology and Social Policy at the Open University and is a visiting professor in gender studies at the LSE in the UK. She's a former specialist advisor to the House of Commons, um, selected committee on employment in the UK, and she currently lives in France. So very warm welcome to you, Jane, and I give you the floor for the report of the last webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, and for such a detailed introduction to me. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and just to say also, you know, in, in terms of what both Susan and Rosella have said in terms of solidarity with our colleagues in the trade union movement, in the public services, who are keeping services going during this horrendous invasion and war in the Ukraine. Um, and I think we all give our solidarity and support um, in whatever way we can. So I'll just give you a very brief overview of the last webinar. Um, and some of you may have been at the webinar and I think it was a really, really interesting webinar for, for us and for the project because it was on this issue of digitalization and third party violence and harassment. And I think one of the themes that was running throughout the webinar was just how important the issue has become in the context of both the pandemic and in the rapidly changing world of work where digitalization is becoming more and more prominent. Um, and one thing that was discussed in the webinar was, was really about, and Nadja uh, Salson, who introduced this, um, talked about you know, the role of digitalization on the economy and public services and how it has come onto the agenda of the social partners. So we're seeing more and more initiatives being agreed through collective bargaining, joint statements, um, social parts, partner uh, agreements and so on, on digitalization in education. The ETUC has also put out their uh, um, uh, um, joint uh, ETUC statement on, on, on digitalization. Um, and there are others coming, for example, EPSU is negotiating one at the moment with the employers on digital digitalization in relation to uh, central government services. So it was interesting because we had a few experts who came and spoke at the webinar. Matthias Wouters, who was part of the um, ILO study on upgrading uh, protection against cyberbullying. Um, an interesting study that gave, perhaps it's one of the very few studies that has been carried out that gave definitions of cyberbullying, actually highlighted the need for common definitions across Europe because each country in their laws where they exist have different definitions. But one thing is clear from those studies is that cyberbullying has been increasing significantly. So in the university sector, for example, up to 20% of, of university staff have experienced cyberbullying, 22% of teachers in the Czech Republic, 22% of journalists in Sweden. And I think we've seen in recent years increasing levels of you know, very severe forms of um, death threats, of um, bullying and harassment, particularly against women journalists and women in high profile public positions as well. 72% um, of public services in Australia said that they had experienced cyberbullying. So it's a big issue. Some of the laws have already addressed this issue, for example, laws in Belgium and Sweden. Um, but I think one of the issues that's very clear and in relation to the multi-sectoral um, guidelines is that we need to be looking at how we can align laws, policies, collective bargaining agreements around common definitions. Um, there's also a, a presentation from EU OSHA, from one of the experts, Tim Tre Tregenza, who spoke about the modern day challenges from digitalization in relation to teleworking. Um, and he argued very strongly, and I think this has come out in our other parts of, of the project, indeed also in the webinar on risk assessment, about how we need to make sure that risk assessments are up to date um, and are able to deal with and capture First of all, gender responsive um, and gender sensitive uh, measures, but also 
link into new issues arising from digitalization, increasing levels of teleworking, remote working, and so on. Um, and we had in very, very good examples from the social partners, um, from the education sector, and some of the recent um, work that's been carried out on digitalization, um, and also uh, from the ETUC on the cross-sectoral social partner guidelines. Um, and framework agreement on digitalization. And there was a really good discussion um, around the issue. And I think for a lot of people, it's a very new issue. And one that I think there was broad agreement should be addressed in the guidelines itself, themselves. Um, one of the things that was very clear in the discussion, you know, both teachers and public servants working in other customer facing services said that, you know, the issue of third party violence and harassment is tolerated, it's seen as part of the job and people rarely complain and partly they don't complain because there's no policies or structures in place. Um, it's really important that this is built into training, teacher training, for example, and that we take a life course approach to the issue in relation to occupational safety and health. Um, so the needs of younger workers may well be different from the needs of older workers who may not be so tech savvy for example. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on the updating of the multi-sectoral guidelines, um, th there was strong commitment to addressing some of these issues in the updating of the guidelines and to really bring them up to date with the modern challenges of digitalization and the rapidly changing world of work. So that's our brief, and there's a the the, uh, the report um, summarising the webinar is on the um, EPSU website and also on the website of the other partners involved in the project. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jane, very much for that uh, recap of uh, of the last uh, webinar. So uh, today we will in our webinar we'll first discuss uh, European and international provisions on compensation, on victim support and compensation. And then we'll focus on three sectoral case studies um, and initiatives at national level. That's the first part. And in the second part of the webinar, we will have a discussion uh, to collect the views on how effective the guidelines have been at national level and uh, in the different areas um, what are the areas for, for improvement? So um, with this, I'm going to actually hand back to Jane <laughs> to introduce our core topic of the discussion uh, from a European and international perspective. So uh, Jane, I'm, I'm giving back the floor to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susan. Um, just to start with, um, I was asked if I could just give a brief recap on the survey that we've carried out on third party violence and harassment and the survey was closed um, at the end of December. So we've done some analysis cleaning up the survey and we have uh, the results available now. Uh, I did give some interim results as the survey was progressing, but we had 165 full responses from 19 countries and also including the European level. Um, the highest level responses um, interestingly came from the prison sector, followed by hospital sector, education and urban transport. Um, of the responses, 59 were from a trade union, 87 were from an employer, uh, 19 didn't specify whether they were from either a trade, un trade union or employer background. Um, in terms of types of violence and harassment experienced in terms of third party violence and harassment, verbal harassment, followed by psychological harassment, and then physical violence and assault are the most common forms of third party violence and harassment. A really interesting finding for the project was 70% of the respondents and the respondents were of national uh, social partner organizations from trade unions and employers, 70% of the respondents were not aware of the multi-sectoral guidelines. There's more awareness amongst the employers than trade unions. Um, and where measures had been already agreed, nearly half were jointly agreed between unions and employers. So these are interesting questions for us in our later discussions. Just very briefly, in terms of the impact on service quality, um, 
a large, the largest number of respondents said that there was a big impact on service quality. And in fact, when we looked at that, when we dig down into that a little bit more detail, we find that the impact on service quality um, was less personalized services or services were withdrawn or services went online for safety reasons. In terms of the impact of, of COVID, um, the largest number of responses said that there was a, a neutral impact. Um, but this was slightly, this needs to be explained Jane? a little bit. Jane, so, sorry, yeah. there is some background noise. If everyone could uh, actually mute their mics, please. Yeah. Thank you. Please, could you mute your mic, please? I think there's somebody who doesn't yes. have that. Um, could, I think that's maybe Mathos. Mathos. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the impact of COVID, um, and for some organisations, the impact wasn't great, or there was no impact or minimal impact because services effectively um, uh, either stopped or they went online, and there was a different there was a different delivery of services. This is just the summary of the measures currently provided to address, to, 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 to address and prevent third party violence and harassment. And the biggest responses were in terms of support given for employees and awareness raising on the issues. I think one of the really interesting things from the comments on the survey is that, in fact, it's not really dealt with very effectively. Um, and often the problem is that complaints procedures don't exist or where they do exist, workers rarely um, report uh, third party violence and harassment. So one of the issues and implications of this, when we look at policies, collective bargaining agreements, risk assessments, all of those issues is to make them more accessible, more relevant um, and implemented to a much greater degree. I mean, it's interesting, 21% of respondents to the survey had no measures at all introduced. Um, types of support that were raised um, for the future of what uh, respondents um, from both trade union and employer backgrounds, and I just put these separate because I think that's quite interesting in terms of the priorities. Big focus on the importance of sharing good practices and learning from each other, and I think this project is a good example of how that's happening. Um, a significant um, number also highlighted the importance of guidance on risk assessment and prevention, because this does seem to be one of the areas that really more work needs to be carried out and how you can bring third party violence and harassment into existing OSH procedures and risk, risk assessment and risk management um, and also mitigation measures. And then just in terms of, and I think this will be relevant in terms of our later discussions, but specific recommendations that were made about the revision of the guidelines. These were responses from people who knew about the guidelines. Um, this is just a, a, a summary of some of the measures that people thought could be introduced. Um, legally binding measures came out as being one of the highest, and this was partly um, uh, from the trade unions in particular, um, but some employer organizations as well, that this could be a legally binding agreement in the future. Um, you know, I, I won't go into the detail of it, you can see online, and we will be publishing this data. Um, but I think, you know, what was clear was the need for much more detailed and sector specific guidance. And I think that's an interesting finding as well in terms of the revision of the guidelines. So I'm just going to move on very quickly to the examples of European and international instruments um, covering existing protection, remedies, and issues around um, sanctions against perpetrators. I mean, already in existing European directives, we have provisions that are relevant to both protection and compensation, particularly covering harassment and sexual harassment. If we look at the European directive, the Equal Treatment Directive of 2006, for example, this argues that member states shall introduce into their national legal systems such measures are necessary for real and effective compensation or reparation as the member state so determines. 
this becomes more difficult to implement around third party violence and harassment. Um, and one of the issues uh, I think we'll be discussing is, is how you can build in um, compensation and protection outside of existing criminal law mechanisms. Um, so I, there's, there's, there's you know, a foothold in the directors, but particularly, I just want to um, flag up the Victims' Rights Directive, which perhaps is the most important measure. Um, it exists within a criminal law framework. Um, so that means that less severe forms of third party violence harassment are less likely to be uh, protected within that framework. So this covers minimum standards on the rights, support and protections of victims of crime. Um, and that, you know, there should be proper protection, support and access to remedies. Um, Article 8 of the directive um, also refers to the importance of victim support services so that they're integrated for victims, uh, particularly of victims of sexual violence, gender based violence, um, and that they should have access to trauma counselling and support. Um, and then Article 9 looks at what those victim support services could include as a minimum. Um, I won't go into the detail of them for because we don't have a huge amount of time, but I think. What is interesting is that these could also be adapted as a kind of framework within the multi-sectoral guidelines in the future in relation to third party violence and harassment about types of support that can be given. Um, just a word about the proposed directive on, on gender-based violence. And uh, this was just mentioned uh, um, earlier because one of the things that we know from the, the proposed directive, which is supposed to have been published by now, but still hasn't, is that it'll cover violence against women, domestic violence, female genital mutilation, all of those different aspects of violence against women that take place inside and outside of the workplace. Um, and that this will be defined in relation to criminal law instruments against gender-based violence. I think, the issue um, that is, is relevant for our discussions is that criminal law um, is obviously really important in providing sanctions and providing frameworks around protection and, and, uh, um, uh, and provision of support services. But one of the things, and the, 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 the proposed, direct, proposed directive for those of you that are not so familiar with it, aims really to implement the Council of Europe Convention on preventing all forms of violence against women and domestic violence, um, which is a really comprehensive, very, very um, important um, instrument that has been ratified by the majority of EU member states, but that are still some member states that refuse to adopt it. Um, and one of the things we know about the convention, as wonderful, comprehensive um, as it is, is that it doesn't really deal in a systematic way with the workplace. And one of the concerns I think of trade unions across Europe is that the proposed directive, by having a criminal law um, foothold, won't be dealing with some of the issues that we need to be addressing in our labor laws um, and other measures uh, that address um, work related um, and the world of work um, uh, issues in relation to violence and harassment, and in particular the issues covered in ILO Convention 190. So I think the trade unions have been doing quite a lot of mobilisation around this, and I know the joint statement that was issued um, for the, the, the International Day Against Violence Against Women in November last year was a part of that. Um, just to say a few words about ILO Convention um, on violence and harassment, which is the Convention 190 and the accompanying recommendation 206. First of all, to say that um, third party violence and harassment is recognized as a, a, a form of workplace violence. So this is a really important starting point because violence and harassment is recognized now in international law as a human rights issue. Um, chapter four of the convention covers specific measures on protection and prevention. Um, 
stating that each member state shall take appropriate measures to prevent violence and harassment in the world of work. Um, and I think this is, is, is really important and it's perhaps a framework that we could be using in the guidelines. Chapter five covers enforcement and remedies, covering legal, social, medical, administrative support for victims, protection against victimization, sanctions against perpetrators, um, and specific supports for victims of gender-based violence and harassment. And recommendation 206 goes into much more detail on this issue, and it gives detailed guidance in relation to um, provisions of supports, right to compensation in the event of damages, and in relation to psychosocial, physical, and other injury or illness that has resulted in capacity to work. Um, so this is an important um, provision in, to, in the guidance. Um, specific workplace supports for victims of domestic violence, and we covered that in a previous um, webinar. Um, and that perpetrators should be held accountable and provided with counselling or other measures in order to prevent the recurrence of violence and harassment. So this is also really important in terms of um, guidance on the implementation of the convention and what that would mean. My last slide is just, and this will be relevant for our, our discussions later on, is in relation to some of the examples that we've been collecting in the project on remedies, protection and compensation initiatives that already exist. So we know that in some countries, um, and this is quite, I think this has been quite innovative, is that insurance companies' compensation systems um, can, um, can specify reduced premiums if workplace policies, prevention or other workplace measures are in place. So this has been introduced in Slovenia and Italy, for example, and possibly in other countries as well. Um, and in Italy, I know that the unions negotiated this into their collective bargaining agreements in some sectors as a way of reducing insurance companies' compensation systems um, and the premiums that were paid. So I think that's quite a, you know, it's quite a strong um, push to... Uh, address those issues as well and, and has helped to incentivize employers. Some, ingre some agreements and workplace policies contain protection and compensation measures. That could be compensation for damages, harm suffered as a result of a legal claim against an employer. Uh, it could be support for victims and survivors, including paid leave, counselling and sanctions. Domestic violence supports, I won't go into the detail of those, um, but they include things like paid leave, job relocation. Um, and some agreements and policies have referred directly to different sanctions and ways of holding perpetrators accountable. And I think there's a very big change happening at the moment in terms of prevention of violence and harassment and the need to really do something around perpetrators because just sacking somebody as a sanction doesn't stop them perpetrating violence and harassment. Um, indeed, in relation to third parties, there are issues about how you implement sanctions and hold perpetrators accountable. Um, and one of the really interesting developments, I think, in the prevention world is how to implement both targeted forms of, of prevention with perpetrators through counseling or treatment programs, um, but also address prevention through universal uh, campaigns directed at, at young men, boys, men, young people, particularly in the context of rising levels of digital violence and harassment. So those are some of the, just a, a very brief summary and I'll pass back to Susan now, thank you. Thank you, Jane, that was really interesting. That was very, very helpful now for our discussion that we're going to have um, uh, later. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, maybe at some point later we'll, we'll put up um, uh, one of, all the, um, of those slides back um, again for mm. just remind ourselves so it's very helpful thank you very much colleagues i will i will pass us on now then um indeed to our um presentations um 
and our part on the protection, support, uh, services and compensation of victims. And we have several um, presentations here. Uh, we have multi-sectoral um, initiatives, but also sectoral initiatives. Um, and I'll, I'm happy to introduce um, the first initiative um, on um, multi-sectoral um, uh, in initiatives, on trade union in initiatives for the protection of victims of all types of violence. Um, and the presentation will be given to us by Dr. Alessandra Menelao um, from UIL School in Italy. Um, she is the national responsible of the UEL listening centers, mobbing and stalking against any violence. And she graduated in psychology and her work is on psychology of violence, victimology. And she's been working uh, for some years now. She's been a lecturer at the University of uh, Casino and special advisor uh, for several research centers. She's also the member of the technical committee for the National Strategic Plan on Violence Against Women at the Minister of <coughs> Opportunities. So a warm welcome to you. Um, and um, please, the floor is yours for your presentation. Grazie, buongiorno a tutti. Um, io voglio partire da un presupposto che... Uh, even now that we have a war, it's important to say that we need to build a democratic society. We need to fight against any kind of violence and both violence at work and domestic is a human right violence. Let's move on. This is the first point that we would like to point out and a departing point as well. The help desk that we established are deployed all over Italy. I, in my first part of my presentation, I will focus on what these help desks are, what do they do, what are their tasks and who is working in these help desks and what is the intervention protocol and what are the instruments that we put in place. These help desks are supporting victims of violence, no matter what violence. Let's move on with the next slide, please. It's a support service that UIL is uh, uh, giving to all citizens, no matter if they are workers, students, uh, retired people, no matter what they are doing and where they are living. We are putting in place actions to prevent and fight any type of violence, no matter if the person is affiliated to our union or not. Let's move on. We offer a study to put in place strategies to tackle the issues and information. What is information? It's something major and as well, raising awareness and consulting. So who is working in this uh, help desks? First of all, the union responsible for this, for the area. It can be also a lawyer as well as a psychologist. The help desk is a safe space where the victims can express and report their situation. This is paramount for us because often in our support service, we found people that are telling to us very dramatic stories about their lives. And in our service, they 
feel safe and they can find a solution uh, in line with the rules that we have in Italy. Let's move on. The first thing that we do is the request to be helped. Then we uh, delve into the problem and we analyze the problem and then we uh, address the problem with an assessment. Let's move on. First of all, well, the request to be helped, people have a first uh, interview in the case of, of the COVID, we organized the first meeting with via digital platforms because it was not possible to uh, meet in person the victim. Let's move on. Secondly, we have this interview and we have uh, uh, no judgmental uh, approach we try to welcome the person the victim this person is meeting the responsible person which the psychologist we aim at giving a welcoming to the victim in respect to the story that is told to us we want to know the background of the victim we try to uh, find from the story that the victim is telling to us the best so that we can help her or him. Let's move on. And then we also give as a first response what we can offer. Often we realized that people do not know what their rights are and they do not have enough knowledge of the Italian rules. So what we do, we uh, train and we raise awareness on the problems and we verify all the demands that we receive because often they ask us things that we cannot tackle according to the rules or according to the collective agreements. So what do we do? We formalize a report uh, that is linked with the needs of the person. And this is very important because we build our action on the basis of the different situations that we are facing and on the basis of the story of the background of the victim Let's move on. If we are talking about a, a problem with the unions, we have at the moment some very delicate cases of sexual harassment on, at, at, at work. What do we do? We uh, try to contact the responsible peoples because we have to put in place an action to fight immediately the violence that is perpetrated. Let's move on. There are a variety of cases. If we have mobbing, for example, the actions uh, have to be reiterated in the time and you need evidence both on documents and um, people that can testify this harassment. So we try to find proof and evidence of mobbing so that we can report this mobbing. The same applies when it 
comes to sexual harassment, we do our best to find the proofs. And when it comes to violence, we act differently because firstly, we uh, verify the violence that is uh, suffered and we try to understand the needs of the victim. And this is a very delicate point, if you want. Let's move on. After this evaluation, we meet all together and we decide what shall we do? If it's a union uh, problem or if it's a psychological or legal support, or we also implement networking activities, uh, especially uh, in the case of gender violence. And we work hand in hand with all the support services for victims. And when we decide the interventions on the basis of the evidence and the risk analysis, then we meet again, we convene again, and we build the, uh, the action to be put in place. Let's move on. All this is made via psychological and legal support that we do in our centers and that we do in uh, UIL. And we do all this via um, guidelines. Let's move on. Here, I would like to introduce to you the users. The majority of them, 66% are females and 34% are men. But this is easy to say because when it comes to mobbing, we can always we can also have men who are suffering mobbing. When it comes to the age, we have a range between 41 and 60, as you can see on the slides, 31%, 41.50, and 34%, 51.60 years old. Let's move on. We are eradicated all over Italy, but the majority of our users live in the region of Latium and Lombardy. And that's because the population in those regions is larger. What are the specific requests that we receive? People addressing our support service are between 41 and 50 years old and are suffering mobbing and stalking as well as uh, uh, harassment at work. Between 51 and 60 years old, they are suffering violence, uh, harassment at work and uh, uh, harassment in general. Let's move on. What is the support that is requested? The support can also be uh, given together by the legal and the psychological service. People between 41 and 50 are requesting uh, uh, legal and psychological support. When it comes to union support, we have 34% between 41 and 60 years old. And when it comes to psychological support, 38%. When it comes to 51, 60 years old, we have more or less the same data. Let's move on. When it comes to the type of the violence perpetrated, the, uh, regarding the gender, we have the female that are taking the major role here. 
I will uh, tell you that 63% are addressing our request of mobbing, 69% stalking, 86% violence, 69% harassment at work and 74% of general harassment. Let's move on. Here, when it comes to the gender, we can see that the majority of the requests are coming from women. Uh, and we have a percentage between 67 and 74%. Let's move on. In Italy, we have an instrument that is not very well known, which is the uh, parental leave for women that are victim of violence. And we ask this also via our uh, employer, uh, employer organizations. And this is an instrument that was launched in 2016. And we have, and these are the percentage 20, 30, 20, 30 years, 10%, 31, 40 years, 31% of women, 41, 50 years, 40%, 51, 60, uh, 15%, and a small percentage of people being older than 60, 4%. This is uh, an instrument that should be um, spread and, and we should raise awareness on this instrument. And we requested our minister that this instrument can be better implemented. I have to say that this instrument is very complicated sometimes to be accessed. So in my opinion, it should be uh, simplified. On this, I would like to tell you that the uh, INPS uh, answer, which is the Italian uh, organization for labor, we, have, we are still waiting for a clear answer from them. So we will be waiting. The majority, no, we move forward. Let's move on. The majority of the requests are coming from Lombardy, 24%, and Veneto, 14%. Let's move on. Here, I would like to introduce you the different topics that we are addressing. First of all, violence uh, uh, at work. According to Italian laws, this is an intentional uh, behavior that is perpetrated. Uh, of... Then there is a psychological violence, which is an intentional behavior to put into danger the psychological integrity of a person via threats and then sexual harassment which is a phenomenon that is increasing and we have more and more requests. So you are forcing another person to um, have sexual uh, relationships. And this is also due to pandemic, but also to the economic crisis. Then we have physical violence, which are um, bad behaviors to the physical integrity. Let's move on. Gender violence is all the violence based on gender that are causing physical, psychological, or economic damage, as well as the threats, as well as the um, restraining the freedom of the victim. Here you can have uh, examples of domestic violence. And it's very important to talk about this slide on uh, since 2016-17, we, we are uh, counting the number of femicide or feminicide in Italy. So what is feminicide? Are murdered 
women within the domestic context. Since 2017, we see that the data are not changing that much. We had 106 in 2017 and 100 in 2021. So more or less the data are very similar. We have a decrease in 2019, but for the rest, the data is more or less the same. This means one thing that all the policies, the policies in Italy do not succeed to prevent this uh, score, scorch. The uh, ILO convention was ratified, the, the, the convention has been ratified, but the results are not there. The Istanbul Convention stipulates that we have to uh, do national programs against gen gender violence. And last year, we launched a plan after 11 months and now we are still missing the operative plan. So this is a very delicate point because in order to prevent feminicide, the Istanbul Convention is our best instrument to tackle this uh, phenomenon. I have to say that the national plan that was launched in November is very good, but it has to be implemented uh, um, with an operative plan, and I hope that it will be put in place as soon as possible. Let's move on. Law against violence. Italy has worked a lot. It's since 1931 that Italy is trying to tackle this phenomenon. In 2019, we modified the uh, criminal code with something called red code. And this was a major step forward because we uh, uh, talked about cyber bullism, um, cyber porn, as well as we put on the table uh, um, reparation for men who committed the crime if they are undergoing a psychological uh, treatment. So as you can understand, this is a very delicate uh, topic. Uh, So let's go ahead. So this is gender-based violence uh, uh, in general. We also have the European Parliament view. Then the different conventions Alessandra? existing. Alessandra, can I ask you to wrap up? Can I, can I ask you to wrap up? It's a very interesting presentation, but we have some more speakers on the line, so thank you. Yes, just uh, the last slide, slide number 39. So the main problems in Italy, uh, I've already talked about it. So evidence, I mean, the victims have to bring the evidence. So, so this is very, very, a uh, difficult issue because victims often uh, don't uh, have evidence, so they just cannot bring evidence. And then, of course, we have to do uh, something against violent men. So this is also uh, something that we have to change. So we uh, want something more accurate because uh, many, many women are at risk. 
we also have to say that uh, not always we have proper laws to uh, apply to those cases. And then, of course, we need more training for the different operators, for the different uh, workers that work in this field. And then we have also made a lot of studies, a lot of research, and we know that only few uh, know the laws on uh, GBV, on gender-based violence, and on uh, sexual harassment. That's also one great issue. And then, uh, actually, there is also, there is also another uh, very hot topic, which is uh, the fact that women uh, that go to the police uh, to uh, talk about uh, violence and uh, sexual harassment, uh, but then uh, they are considered as being uh, too much uh, afraid of, uh, of the situation. And often those uh, women don't even go to the police because the police often they don't uh, trust them. And often the kids are taken away from the mothers and they stay with the violent, violent uh, father. So this is also a very hot topic on which we will have to work hard in Europe. I'm so sorry to be, uh, to be so long and uh, thank you. So thank you, thank you very much for this very interesting Grazie presentation mille and all the work that you're doing um, on, on, this to, on this important topic and especially what is so interesting about this that this is a multi-sectoral approach um, because there's so many different um, uh, layers that come together and uh, it's uh, really con congratulations for, for that work and, and uh, good, good continuation. And it's interesting also that you highlighted some of the challenges that you um, uh, well, face and still face, and that you will be um, uh, working on uh, in in the in the future. Um, conscious of time, I will I will move us on to the next speaker. Um, we will have the time for questions. Um, so, colleagues, if you have questions to our speakers, please um, be uh, be prepare them, make uh, be ready to ask them at the end of our four um, uh, case study presentations. And I will now move us on to a presentation from the transport sector um, on uh, collective bargaining agreements on uh, uh, victim support and compensation by Kremena Dimitrova from the Federation of Transport Trade Unions in Bulgaria. Um, and Mrs. Dimitrova is international expert for the Federation of Transport um, Trade Unions in Bulgaria since 2018. Um, and during this period, she took part in several events and initiatives, and especially targeting um, the sector, the transport sector. And uh, her work includes participating in negotiations for new collective bargaining agreements. And she's got more than 10 years experience uh, in European funding. And for the last two years, she's been working as an advisor for Ekaterina Yordanova, the president of the Federation of Transport Trade Unions in Bulgaria. And she has actively supported her in the duties as member of the Women's Committee at national, European and international level. Um, and now she is working um, as a representative of the uh, Maritime and Fisheries Programme, Operational Programme, Regional Development and Operational Programme, Human Resources Development. So we welcome you very much. Um, and look forward to your presentation. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Thank you. Um, um, Kremena, we can hardly hear you. Can you can you get closer to the microphone? Yes. I hope that you hear me now. Ah, this is much better. Absolutely, yes. Please. <laughs> Uh, so uh, today I will take the opportunity to uh, uh, to speak on my native language. So I speak from Bulgarian language. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Really.
така. Thank you. The idea was for us to share our experience in relation to the clauses and the provisions in our collective bargaining agreement within the transport sector and our experience that we have, the way we achieved it in our Federation of Transport Trade Unions. It was a long journey for them, not easy journey. And having in mind that um, violence at work and every act that take the dignity of people, they take the rights of people within the framework of existing law and it's expressed in physical and psychological violence and assault of personality and individuals integrity and dignity And especially if we have in mind this definition, it's enough for everyone who is working, who is within this um, category of a labor relationship, relationship to make this their mission to prevent and to overcome the violence at work. And this became the, our main provision in our trade union in the last 14 years. It's very important for these regulations to be part of our collective bargaining agreement and to work in this direction. For more than 40 years, as I said, we fight to prevent violence at work and to protect women against violence in the transport sector because this is a very sensitive topic within our sector. Women in this sector have been neglected, because uh, not many women used to work in this sector, were engaged in this sector, and that was a, that was, it was a big problem. Of course, nowadays it's different, the situation is different. The employment in this sector is equal. Throughout the years, we have carried out a, a lot of campaigns in relation to violence at work, but one of the first campaigns and the most popular campaigns was a round table, or the round tables that we organized within our union, transport union. And this is where we started to work towards the increase of our awareness about the existence of violence at work, about the importance of this problem. Because for many years, this problem hasn't been discussed, this problem hasn't been shared because people were worried to share because they never, they thought they wouldn't be understand. They thought that no one is actually going to listen to them. That's why it's very important to increase awareness of this problem and also to, carry discussions on this topic, and of course, to prevent it. After these round tables, we conducted researchers surveys in order to actually found the core and the main problem to understand which are the specific problems in relation to these situations. After that, we reached very successful agreements who were concluded with many of the municipalities. And one of th those agreements were in relation to pr protection and prevention of violence at work. And this agreement was con concluded with the, uh, the urban transport for the cap capital cities and because as you know, the largest, um, the capital usually has the largest population within the country. And this um, municipality, uh, the capital municipality and the capital urban transport is one of the largest municipalities. And this agreement signed with the capital urban transport played a key role to be after that used in different other large, city, large cities in Bulgaria. In relation to prevention of violence at work, first within the urban transport, but then not only in different municipalities, this type of agreement was signed also with many 
uh, companies in the transport sectors. This agreement, of course, supports the development of, you can call it a methodology and, uh, for action, for collecting information in relation to violence, first only against women, but later on, violence against everyone else, of course. And this agreement gives certain recommendations to implement policy for prevention of uh, violence at work. It also creates and maintains a database for acts of violence because at some stage, violent, acts of violence started repeating. So it was very important to collect this database in order to find a solution for this problem. And of course, very important it is to guarantee the confidentiality of victims, because this is the reason for many of the victims not to come forward and to share because they were worried that they will be used as um, examples and they'll have uh, further on problems at work. So they, did, they weren't really inclined to share these problems. And also to define specific confidential persons or specific people within the company where the victims can um, turn to. And of course, these problems, we always, uh, we always rely within this problem, we always rely on our social partners as well. This agreement also gives recommendation in relation to the implementation of good practices in the fight against violence to conduct training on the topic. This is one of the trade union actions to conduct training because many people are not really sure how exactly to share their problems, who to turn to, how to explain that they have problems. And for example, if they have a problem, they probably think that this wasn't really violence and also to develop campaigns for zero tolerance addressed towards communities and to show sympathy towards the victims and to show that this type of behavior is not going to be tolerated. These are some of our campaigns that we have carried out in relation to equality and roundtables, these agreements, these campaign, campaigns they led to a self-defense course. So women took part in a self-defense courses in order to learn how to defend themselves. And also we employed psychologists in many of the companies. One of the key act actions that we undertook and which contributed towards the solution of these problems was to employ psychologists in order for people to be able to uh, look for or to search for mental, mental health support and help because very often, often people are traumatized and suffer mental trauma. And therefore, if this trauma is not solved on time, the situation becomes even more pro the situation becomes more problematic. Specialized training, special these trainings, they are conducted in many of the companies and they really show results, this type of trainings, and we think they're very useful. The 43rd Congress of the ITF, who was held in Sofia in 2014, also during this Congress, we focused on the topic. All those efforts, of the Federation of Transport Trade Unions in Bulgaria. They led to the inclusion of 2014 in the sectorial collective bargaining agreement in the transport sector. A specific chapter was included dedicated to the protection against violence at work and the gender equality. Of course, this is extremely important and it's connected to the directives And these directives were included within our legal documentations on time. And this is what it's included. 
I'm not going to dedicate more time to other things really. For me, it's very important to show you that the employer together with the union undertake effective measures to manage the psychosocial risks at work. The employer is mentioned in all the professions because the, the employer's role is very important to guarantee work conditions in order to prevent mental health trauma at work, psychological trauma at work and physical trauma at work. They also guarantee the principle, the implementation of the principle for equality between genders in relation to salaries and to payment, the access to training, career, career development, the right to use um, paid holiday in order to look after a child. And the employer also has a policy for zero tolerance in relation to violence at work, all different types of violence, psychological, physical, and sexual violence. Of course, the employer also, based on a specific procedure, they are allowed to pay compensation to a, a victim, to an employer, to an employee who has suffered injuries in order for them to treat themselves. And also the employer has to implement procedures that need to be followed in order there is violence and harassment at work. And these procedures must include the immediate internal investigation and hearing of the victim. So the victim is able to share the problems, to create conditions, to predispose the victim to share the problem. Feedback, of course, feedback is very important because the other side also needs to be heard, undertaking of adequate disciplinary measures especially if the perpetrators are also employees of the companies and of course, victim, some victim support and specifically providing a mental health support measures for preventing violence and harassment at work, gender-based violence and harassment at work also need to be included within the regulations, the employment regulations. All those provisions are included in um, the collective bargaining agreements in most of the sector and most of the transport sector. And maybe here I need to mention as well that the Federation of Transport Trade Unions in Bulgaria, they continue their policies, their actions to fight violence. And that is why they play a very big role into the promoting and ratifying the Convention 190 in Bulgaria. And Ms. Katerina Yordanova actively takes part into the, into the, in the development of the convention. Of course, agreements with most of the largest cities in Bulgaria have been concluded. Initiatives and recommendations have also been entered in the ministry. And in December last year, we held a meeting of the Union Council in also to establish an initiative committee for organizing a national local citizen initiative to ratify the adopted in 2019 Convention 190. And of course, we can see the results already and we are almost, almost there. We're gonna we're going to manage to achieve our goal very soon. Good practices who have been shared by the Federation of Transport Trade Unions in Bulgaria, they include that for us, it's very important to, from initiatives, to move towards actions uh, in terms of concluding agreements, signing agreements, and uh, actions that include specialized training, uh, our own projects, including involvement of people, team building exercises, team building exercises in terms of culture, sport, tourism, climate change, voluntary actions, again, violence, and the conclusions that we've reached.
based on everything that we've gone through and our actions that we need, need more training. We shouldn't be happy with the fact that one company or one team has carried out some kind of training. No, that should make us happy. We need to go back towards this problem. We need to talk about this problem and share it with everyone. And of course, our federation have to, taken part in many uh, charity events and concerts, art games, violence as well is also helping us and helping our organization. And one of the most popular initiatives is something that's turned into our message or our logo is sport against argument. These words in Bulgarian are very similar, so we can play with them because there's only one letter, the, there's only one letter difference between these two words. So FTTUB organized yearly this type of uh, sport, com sport competitions. Many people take part in these competitions and this is one of the most weighted events for our organization and our members because during this type of event, people, they forget their problems, they forget their differences, they unite and they unite and they use their positive energy to solve their problems. These are also different initiatives. These initiatives are carried out in the form of team building exercises. We know that our country is very famous for uh, the rose and uh, picking up roses is another uh, event that we've organized as well. Thank you for your attention. I hope that everything that I shared as our experience was useful for you. And hopefully you've managed to take from us and you've managed to understand that what we've achieved has been achieved with a lot of effort. But even though we're going to continue to work towards it and we never we're never going to give up. So can I, you, you're on, on. Thank you. Thank you very much for that interesting presentation. And especially as it's a sectoral approach. Um, and so you, you had the, the uh, collective uh, agreement uh, or agreements on, on victim support and compensation. It's very interesting. And especially the focus on training and the need for continuous training a specific training on the topic, but also in general to, to continue uh, to raise awareness and to um, prepare uh, uh, the workers in, in the sector, and but also raising that so oh, this, uh, um, uh, yeah, the awareness raising and uh, ensuring that people are conscious also of, of the issue indeed. Very good. Thank you very much for that for that presentation. And uh, I will move us on now to our next speaker, um, who will be speaking on the prevention of violence and protection of victims um, from the European Transport Workers Federation and the Union, the International Union of uh, um, Public Transport, um, Brigitte Ollier, um, who's the Senior Advisor on Social Affairs. Uh, of the International um, Public Transport Union, um, and which is the uh, international association representing public transport stakeholders. And the European, uh, in the European Union, UITP brings together more than 450 urban, suburban, and regional public transport operators and authorities from all member states. It represents the perspective of short distance passenger transport services by all sustainable modes, bus, regional and suburban rail, um, and so on. And the sector is a major employer, as you can imagine, at local level with more than 2 million um, jobs. And uh, Brigitte um, Ollier is responsible for, responsible for the European Social Dialogue. And within that context, um, uh, several joint statements with the European Transport Workers Federation have been developed. And the latest one covers insecurity and the feeling of insecurity in local public transport and the digital transformation and social dialogue in urban public transport in Europe. It sounds very interesting, and we look very much forward to your presentation now, Brigitte. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I think that my presentation will be 
quite complementary to the very interesting presentations that, that we just um, heard. I have no presentation, but um, you will be able to read um, also the joint statements that we have agreed upon with ETF uh, to, to, yeah, maybe to, to better understand or, or find more details. So briefly um, on UITP, you have said a few words already um, on UITP. UITP is the International Association for Public Transport. Um, as you said, in the EU, we represent uh, both operators and authorities, which are responsible for urban public transport. Um, when we speak in the social dialogue, and that's one of my areas of competence or of responsibility, then obviously we will just speak for the public transport operators, members of UITP, and these are the companies that are operating directly on the spot, the buses, trams, metros, uh, etc. I think it is important to understand also that the sector is very diverse. Uh, we have very small companies, we have very big companies. Uh, it depends um, of, on the size of the city most of the time. Uh, we have also operators that just operate one mode, for example, just buses. We have operators that uh, operate two modes or all modes. So very, very diverse um, sector. Um, important to understand also is that the sector is organized with public service contracts. Uh, these contracts, in fact, uh, lay down um, the level of service that the authority wants to provide to the citizens of the region of competence of this authority. On the one side, so level of service, and on the, on the other side, it provides also the financial compensation that will be provided to the operator. And there are two different ways to, to uh, award those contracts. So the authority may award it directly to an internal operator, so to a public company, but they can also put this contract into tender. And in that case, it will be a private company that um, will be operating public transport. So we have as members, publicly owned companies, but also privately owned companies. The common denominator is that all these companies are operating buses, trams, metros. So in the end, they're doing the same job. So um, the European Social Dialogue um, is, is an activity that we are, um, that we are uh, actively uh, following up since yeah, 15 to 20 years, I would say. And one of our first uh, recommendations that we have signed with ETF was in fact in the field of uh, insecurity and the feeling of insecurity in local public transport. So it's a topic that we know quite well. And um, yes, that, that we are following uh, since a, a lot of years already. So si since 15 years ago, um, societies have changed. Also the threats have changed, the third party violence, the way this violence uh, exists has changed. Uh, we have seen also uh, with the COVID crisis, um, um, like one of the previous speakers said that in some networks at least um, there was an increase quite an increase uh, of the level of violence that's not it's not a general statement some some smaller networks um, didn't report this increase of violence but we have had also quite um, uh, alarming i think and um, uh, information from some of our members due to this uh, covid crisis so all these developments obviously call for adjusted practices from the side of the public transport operators, obviously, but also from the side of the authorities that also have to take their responsibility and understand the problem and provide also the appropriate funding. So I think this is very important. Um, we are very much for many of those activities dependent also from um, funding which is provided by, um, by the um, responsible authorities. So um, why did we tackle this problem already 15 years ago? Because obviously third party violence has a huge impact on the confidence and dignity of the persons 
of our workers, of our staff, and it has also a real economic effect, effect in terms of absences, well-being, staff turnover. It has an impact on our passengers. Uh, if you have a feeling of insecurity as a passenger, you will avoid taking the bus, taking the metro, taking the tram. So um, there, is, um, th there are many reasons why this, um, this uh, um, uh, field, this violence has really to be, to be tackled. So we, um, during our last discussions with ETF, we have discussed also the internal violence, harassment, bullying, etc. And um, from our perspective, at least, um, we think that um, these, these, uh, these occurrences should be tackled differently in the company. Um, we agree, I think, with ETF and with every one of you that both phen phenomena are equally unacceptable and call for strong action to fight those occurrences. This is, is out, out of question. But I will maybe now uh, concentrate really on, on third party um, violence. So we have recommended to our members to, so the management, so the companies, but also trade unions to develop adjusted and evolutionary agreements, which should be obviously in accordance with the um, prevailing national and local regulations, but also with the size of the problem in terms of vandalism, uh, incivilities, physical or verbal aggression, harassment, etc. Because as I said before, um, the size of the problem will be very different from city to city uh, and even from country to country. Il problema and, cambia rispetto al paese che si prende in considerazione. I, I have an, an Italian translation. Uh, <laughs> and obviously, uh, it is very important for all companies to guarantee a safe and secure working environment, as well as a quality of service for the users of public transport. And I think it was very interesting also to see your chart, Jane, about the influence of violence on the quality of service. I can say for our sector that there is a huge impact. So um, we have proposed guidelines to support our members uh, with an action-oriented um, initiative, which should obviously be adjusted to the different companies. And the most important, or, the, yeah, or, or one of the most important or first actions is really the prevention. And I would, would like to just um, uh, briefly present what we mean by prevention. By prevention, we, need, we mean first the raising of awareness of our own staff um, and also of passengers, um, of managers, workers, passengers to this problem. So it isn't our own staff, obviously, but it is also passengers. So, uh, and we, 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 we propose, for example, communication campaigns uh, for passengers. Um, and sometimes uh, you will see if you, if you, if you are public transport, uh, user regulars, you will certainly see this campaign sometimes uh, spread over over the network. But uh, important is also specific training for managers to handle these difficult situations, but also for frontline for frontline workers who are confronted uh, may, maybe on a regular basis. I hope not, but sometimes it arrives. It happens. Uh, with these um, with these situations, so uh, it is important most of the time to keep your temper, to develop de-escalating skills, etc. And this type of training is also offered to bus drivers and other um, uh, frontline staff to help already to manage a bit tense situations, so that there is no uh, escalation, in fact, um, in in the violence. And it is important, obviously, to demonstrate the strong commitment of social partners to working together to address uh, this issue. The second um, uh, area of prevention is really the discussion and close cooperation with police forces and justice institutions. And there we believe, we are convinced that appropriate and rapid intervention after an incident 
um, should I ideally take place very quickly and lead also to an almost immediate punishment of the, of, of the offenders and prevent, in, as far as possible, repeat offenders. And I think this is very important first to, um, to, uh, to, 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 um, to be sure that there is no instillment, instilling, in fact, in victims of a feeling of ab abandonment. And I think that's very important. Uh, the victims have to be have to have at least the, the, the feeling that they are supported, that they are heard, and, and um, a rapid intervention from police forces, I think, is an element in this, um, uh, in this process. And it is important uh, also to combat this sense of feeling of impunity that some offenders may have, and then um, uh, just repeat again and again the same type of uh, offenses. And sometimes, for example, we hear also that offenders that after being caught by police forces are freed again after two hours and are taunting again the same bus drivers on the same lines. So these are really situations that are absolutely unacceptable and we have to, um, to develop this understanding also with the police forces and the justice institutions just to, 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 to combat this type of repeat um, uh, situations. Then obviously for us, it is also important to, to have a continuous dialogue with the competent authorities because also the authorities have to understand um, the type of problem um, and also to agree and to understand the strategy or, or the investments that will be needed to, um, to, uh, to, 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 to um, uh, combat, in fact, um, these uh, type of violences. And um, authorities have obviously also to provide uh, the needed dedicated funding. Last but not least, um, important is also to engage in the civil dialogue, and that's also something that many of our members do with NGOs, with users associations, with local media, in, 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 in social media also, or sometimes even in schools, to promote also a better mutual understanding and help to better address difficult groups, sometimes in difficult um, surroundings. Um, to help preventing uh, aggressive behaviors. So I think this is already quite important to, um, to, to, to really address, not just the company with the, with the trade unions, but to really um, address all the stakeholders which, um, which are important in this type of, uh, of process. So on the company level, uh, obviously the first thing which is very important are the complaint procedures. I think it has been said already, collecting um, the information for assessing the nature and size of the problem. This has to be as accurate as possible because um, obviously uh, the, um, the strategy to tackle third party violence will be based on this reporting system. And this instrument has to be simple, efficient, and acceptable for both sides of industry, so, so for the workers and also for the management, very important. Then at the company level, it's also important to set the right balance between technological devices and people. So when I say technological devices, I'm speaking uh, about CCTV, for example. And if you're taking buses or um, other vehicles, you will see that uh, most of these vehicles now have uh, cameras on board. So they are recording. Um, so it is a technological device, uh, but which will be helpful in case of an, act, uh, of an incident, but it is not always yeah, very helpful in preventing um, incidents. So technological devices are important, so safety equipments, etc. But people are very important too. It is important to show presence. It is important to have also appropriate 
patrol, patrol um, positioning uh, and composition in the places where you know um, that they might be uh, problems of uh, aggression or, or um, uh, aggressive behaviors. And here again, training of staff is, is very important. So investments into technology, yes, but investments also into people, very important. Brigitte, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it is really it, very interesting, but I'll have to ask you to wrap up. I, I yes, have, okay. I have time for some discussion at the end of today. Thank yes, you. yes, 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 I understand. So. <laughs> So um, I'm, I will I will maybe come then to the to the last part, which is maybe um, also interesting for you. It's it's about recovery, um, and um, um, so we, we have spoken about prevention, about what the com the company has to do, but recovery is obviously also important. Um, and um, what we say is also that we need very good support systems um, for staff in place in case of an of an accident. For example, psychological psychological support, legal help, very important. Um, in case, um, for example, the person wants to file a complaint, etc. Um, in terms also of the human resource organization, we need an appropriate and sensitive handling of employees affected by um, acts of violence, um, etc. Um, on recovery, the <clears throat> Uh, we need um, also um, systems in place like professional counseling or, or also what has been um, uh, uh, presented by previous speakers about uh, managerial or trade union support systems, um, phased return to work options, etc. Um, so, yeah, and last but not least, um, obviously, all these measures. Um, have to have to be part of the general company health and safety policies. I think that's the case in most of our companies, at least in the bigger ones. Um, yeah, maybe I should start here, uh, stop here, and um, and um, I, I will be uh, happy to respond to questions uh, in case you have any questions um, on 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 these joint um, recommendations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brigitte. That was really very interesting uh, to hear and the very many um, uh, different um, aspects also that you brought in and the work that you're doing in the, in the transport um, sector. Um, and uh, um, yeah, it was very good, I think, for, for us also to hear, you know, what are the different challenges indeed that you, you face uh, in, in the transport sector here. Um, linking it also to the different issues like uh, indeed the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, how that has impacted. And of course, then at the end, when you mentioned, went into the, the recovery phase and that we're, we're in which we are now, um, but also linking it to the to technicalities. Um, uh, and I know that is a, is a, a, a big issue, of course, indeed, uh, where, there's, where there is discussion about um, um, uh, private um, or, yeah, um, the protection also of of, uh, of of privacy. So I, I can imagine that this is, is it's really um, uh, also uh, difficult um, in that area to indeed uh, work further on third party violence prevention. Um, and very importantly, also that you mentioned the civil um, uh, society dialogue, uh, which which is an important aspect in particular in the public services um, in in the services when you're working. Uh, indeed, with these uh, uh, your, your third parties, and that's indeed what what all this is about, and in particular also why we um, at the at the beginning uh, assigned together also the multi sectoral guidelines, in particular from the sectors who are experiencing uh, the, the the third party um, violence. So very interesting. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I will pass us on now to our fourth um, speaker. Um, Jordan uh, Krasev from um, the Bulgarian Teacher Union, who will be speaking to us um, on a, an example from the education sector on lobby action for the revision of the National Penal Code. Um, and Jordan is uh, working um, indeed for the uh, Bulgarian Teacher Union. Uh, his area of work includes organizing training for teachers on different topics, such as health and safety at work. He's responsible for the Standing Academy of the Trade Union, 
which deals with the career um, uh, professional development, continuous professional development of teachers. Um, and he also assists um, the president uh, of the union in the international relations um, of the organization. Um, and he has got himself a, a professional interest in the area of digitalization and uh, technology in the education sector. I'm very happy, uh, Jordan, to have you here today with us. And uh, please, the floor is yours. And after that, we will have the opportunity for questions uh, to our speakers. And I'll move us then swiftly into the debate, into the open debate for which we have also prepared questions. Jordan, floor is yours. Perfectly, perfectly, yes. Do you see my presentation? Yes, we presentation? see your presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Do you see the presentation? Yes, we can see your presentation, Jordan. Go ahead. It's a little bit strange here. My microphone wasn't working, so I had to use my mic on my phone, but I'm going to use my laptop to deliver the presentation. So maybe, but I'm going to talk on my phone. So maybe that's why you can't see me. So I'm sorry about that. I've been invited here to talk about our lobbying experience in relation to changing the law in Bulgaria. First, I'd like to show you our trade union, the trade union of Bulgarian teachers is the largest trade union in Bulgaria. We are a main driver in the reforms in the education sector. And we represent the interest of 90% of everyone who works in education in Bulgaria. We are also an official social partner on national level, level and we take part in the tribe Apartheid Council for Social Dialogue to the Ministry of Education, and we are representatives also in the in the cooperation, the Council of Cooperation within the Ministry of Education. And one of our primary duty was to lobbying before the Parliament, before the national authorities public authorities in order to improve the educational system in Bulgaria. Our lobbying efforts, what is our practice and our successes and our achievements in 2013, we managed to actually a group of MPs introduce that first, but because we really insisted on this um, proposal uh, to be introduced before parliament in order to change the penal code in Bulgaria. This is our article 131 of the penal code in Bulgaria. That's what you can see there. You see article 131 of the penal code. Violence against in representatives of institutions like enforcement agents, police officers, investigators, and other people, representatives of law enforcement agencies. A special treatment has been planned if there is an injury. We managed to include here teachers as well within this article. So every violence, against the teacher while at work has to be 
adopted and has to be accepted as a physical injury according to the provision of the penal code. code. And this is extremely important because up to 2013, we had a few cases, registered cases, on violence against teachers on behalf of students. The students were committing violence against teachers, parents were committing violence against teachers. And as you can see here, causing bodily injury, bodily harm, according to the penal code, it, the punishment for that is imprisonment. And the person, the perpetrator could be imprisoned for causing this violence. And of course, this is a special procedure included within the penal code. And of course, certain specific steps need to be followed to register the case, to prepare medical reports for the physical injury, and after that, to start court proceedings. What was interesting is when the penal code was changed, in 2013, we've already had some proceedings which were initiated already, and the perpetrators, the defenders were convicted based on this uh, penal code article. And people actually were convicted and sentenced because they committed violence against teachers. And actually, why did we insist for this change to be included within the penal code? Why did we insist? From 1994, the trade union has been working towards developing this. We were interested in the factors that provoke this type of violence. And one of the conclusions was, if we change the penal code, these cases probably might reduce. And that's exactly what happened. In a survey that we conducted before 2013, before implementing this uh, amendment, we found that 65% of teachers suffer mental violence, psychological violence, and 2.5% suffer physical violence and the physical violence could be committed by their students, parents, or relatives of children or students. What were the cases of aggression from the period of implementing this change, this amendment? Which, what were the registered cases of aggression and violence? You can have a look here on this slide, physical aggressions, 1,662 cases, close to that number. Verbal aggression, 1,603 cases. Psychological harassment, close to 500 cases. Virtual bullying, 50 cases, close to around 50 cases. These are the cases that happened between the students as well. We have 4,000 cases within this category. And of course, what, which, something that was very concerning back then, the aggression towards teachers that was coming from parents. We had 92 cases of violence against teachers by parents. And once we introduced this special provision within the penal code, the next few years, we conducted a survey with the legal department of the trade union, and we noticed that these cases were drastically reduced. And in the last few years, we have only single cases of violence against teachers on behalf of parents. And what is actually the trade union doing on this subject? 
not only when we're talking about changing the provision within the penal code, but in the more broad context, we conduct researches in regarding registering violence cases between parent and student, between student and student, all these type of violent cases in aggression, student and teacher. And of course, that gives us the opportunity to carry out trainings with uh, teachers and help them to prevent and help them to, uh, to teach. And we teach them how to react in a situation like that. Teachers are really interested in this type of training how, about how to react in situations like that. In the last few years, we carried out a few campaigns. One was no to violence. I suppose this type of com campaigns were organized in most of the sectors, but we managed to collect more than 50,000 signatures from teachers and from other citizens who are actually supporting this type of campaign. And these signatures were introduced before the parliament to show our society that violence needs to be stopped and we need to fight against the viol against violence. We need to be more tolerant towards each other. We need to be more understanding towards each other. And we organized another campaign, which was called for kindness in the education, to be good, to be kind to one another, to help each other. All these activities were presented during different conferences on national level. And what we need to, look, to do now is to work on the 190 convention. Last year, together with Kanesebe on the 8th of March, we organized a very large conference dedicated to Convention 190 and its ratification. And the chairman of our trade union, Mrs. Yanka Katova, she's very active. She is a chair of the Equality Commission, Committee in Kanesebe. She is also a chair of the Equality Committee in Netesepe. So we actively, we are actively trying to lobby for the ratification of this convention, how to solve the problem within education the specific steps that we need to undertake and we need to take and the ministry adopts them as an initi as initiative to increase school psychologists second these are our steps second all our trainings more than 11000 teachers have been trained for have been trained to work in risky situations and have been trained on how to prevent aggression and our long-term plan the ministry is planning on increasing the number of extracurricular extra activities out of school activities and by doing that, we hope we'll be able to engage students out of school. We'll be able to engage their energy out of school to be more active out of school, to participate in activities that they're interested in. And of course, we insist on more support staff at school, support personnel at school, support staff who will be able to support teachers because teachers are anyway very busy. So we insist on employing more pedagogical or educational advisors, educational mediators, more support staff for the teachers. And of course, we hope that we'll be able to continue our trainings and those trainings to be conducted throughout the whole year and especially the, the months when teachers usually have their holidays, they'll be able to participate in these trainings and to train teachers to improve their social and emotional skills, emotional intelligence, to train them how to work in stressful situations, how to deal with hyperactive kids, with aggressive parents. 
we can talk a lot on this subject. We still have a lot to do. We have to work together in order to decrease the cases of aggression and violence. Someone said that despite the fact that we work within education, apart, despite the fact that we're really trying to prevent aggression and violence, we still, the cases of violence are still not reducing. But we do hope that our shared efforts Will, will eventually lead to real results in real time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jordan, for your presentation. That was really interesting to hear um, what you're doing um, in, in Bulgaria, in the um, education sector in particular, and uh, how much this uh, change in the, in, the, in the penal code has, has uh, has an impact um, on the topic of um, uh, the prevention of third party violence um, also in the education sector. Um, so thank you very much for that. And uh, colleagues, I will be moving us on. Now. Ah, and the other point I just, I just uh, wanted to highlight indeed um, that you mentioned, which is important uh, about the, the psychological impact and uh, the, the mental health. Indeed, that is, that is very important um, to, to uh, pick up here in, in our discussion. Um, just briefly, colleagues, are there any questions that you have um, towards our presenters? from their presentations, any issues that you would like to address to them in particular? I see a question from uh, Ettore Michelazzi, so I'll give you the floor. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. Ettore Michelazzi, uh, I, I'm part of the uh, union of my school. I would like to thank all the speakers because of course it's a very hot topic and I, uh, I'm very much pleased in seeing uh, the great job done by the uh, colleagues in uh, Bulgaria. I just have a general uh, uh, question for any of the speakers who want to take the floor. So actually two questions. One first slide was saying that um, there was a drop in the uh, feminicides in Italy uh, from 2019. Well, we could think that uh, the pandemic has worsened uh, the situation uh, because in 2018, 2019, things seemed to be better, but then with the pandemic thing, things got worse. So is it just, uh, is the pandemic the real reason for that? And then the other question is, uh, well, actually, uh, what we see as a union is, is just uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's still a lot to see and to know because there are so many people who, who suffer from sexual harassment and uh, all sorts of uh, violence, but people just don't talk about it. Just um, often they don't even want to go to the police to report it. Uh, for example, I uh, got to know two colleagues of mine that didn't go to the police to report uh, an act of violence because they were just afraid of it. So, well, anyway, thank you for uh, for giving me the floor and uh, um, very much appreciated uh, today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much for that for that question. And um, what I will do, um, I'll give, I'll, I'll, we'll collect a couple of questions um, and then give the opportunity to our speakers to to respond. And I see the next person online who's got her hand up is Nadia, I think, um, from EPSU. Nadia. Yeah, thanks and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot to, to the speakers. Um, I, have, I have a couple of questions regarding um, the uh, help desk, uh, which has been set up in Italy by uh, one of the Italian unions, uh, UIL. I, I was wondering whether you would have a 
sexual breakdown of the victims uh, who report to to your head desk, so, so that we would have an idea of uh, uh, whether you know some victims would uh, would be working more in transport or education, um, public services in general, or if you have any information on that, it would be useful. And I'm also quite interested to to know a bit more about the difficulties you are facing with the implementation of the um, of the exceptional leave for victims of survivors uh, of violence, uh, which was introduced in Italy, as you said, in 2016. I think it would be useful to know what uh, those uh, hurdles uh, are. And perhaps given that, um, and again, we see that for every single theme-based webinars that we have organized, that everything is linked uh, in terms of so what unions can do, employers in terms of staffing levels, in terms of cooperation with public authorities, with the police. But regarding today's topic on compensation for, um, for uh, victims, I was wondering, and perhaps it's more a question to, uh, I mean, actually to both perhaps the uh, Italian speaker, but also to Brigitte Ollier, uh, is that do you have any idea of uh, yeah of the level of compensation to to victims and and perhaps in transport um, yeah if you have you have more information on on that and the reintegration also of um, victims in uh, in in um, in the job and uh, and Brigitte I think that, again a very important point is to how to not I mean obviously to prevent violence from taking place, uh, but also how to then avoid a repetition of offenses. And, um, and I was wondering, yeah, I mean, again, uh, whether you would have more, more information uh, on that, on some kind of um, or perhaps successful cases where this has been reduced. Obviously, we can pick it up later at, a, at, a, at some other meetings, um, but that, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you uh, to all speakers. Thank you, Nadia, for, for those questions. And um, I think I'm, I'm going to give the floor to Alessandra first, then to start uh, um, in responding, um, and then to, to Brigitte and, and to the others. I'm conscious of time, so I'm not sure if we're going to manage to get to the debate, colleagues, but uh, we'll try our best. <laughs> so, Alessandra. So as far as the first question is concerned, the number of mm, feminicides uh, in, with the pandemic. So during the pandemic, so the first phase from February to June 2020, we had many, uh, many uh, cases uh, within the families, so many uh, violence cases but then uh, when the situations got better and you know everything reopened uh, the uh, feminicides uh, went up again then uh, 2019 it was a lower number but to me it was just a coincidence just a case because uh, within the last 15 years the average is between 19 and 110 feminicides a year so of course, it's difficult to go to the police and to report it, but it, this is true uh, everywhere in every sector, whatever. It's if it's uh, domestic violence, if it's uh, um, uh, at work, for example, uh, a girl wrote to me uh, uh, last month after being uh, a victim uh, for ten years at work. So she. Uh, wasn't brave enough so it's difficult to go and report it to the police so this then has a, 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 a great impact on the uh, uh, on the mental uh, health of the of the woman they also fear to lose their job as far as the uh, different categories of course we have different data per category of course, I made it simple, but mainly most of the people that are victim of violence uh, at work are those who work in the commercial field.
and also in uh, you know in public uh, services uh, like uh, public transport. Uh, I can give you more specific data if you want, maybe uh, by mail. Then the uh, exceptional leave for uh, the victims. Why is it so difficult? Well, first of all, because women have to prove that they have been victims of violence. So they have to go and see uh, an help desk, a, a, a center, that can uh, uh, help those uh, uh, women. Then uh, those women are given some kind of certificate and then go to the police. So it's very tricky. And then there's also the privacy uh, sphere because uh, it's not so easy. So we asked all the different parties not to tell uh, the colleagues, uh, who is the victim of the violence? Because it could be dangerous. So privacy, vital. And then uh, something I would like to uh, add. We are uh, one of the few countries that when a woman reports to be a victim of uh, domestic violence, she has to leave the, the house with the kids. Whereas there are uh, countries where the man, the violent husband has to leave the, the house, uh, the family house. So you see laws are very different. And then the reintegration of the victims uh, uh, to their job is quite easy. But often in Italy, we move the violent uh, man from his job, or maybe the uh, woman herself decides to change uh, uh, her uh, job or to go to another place. Uh, as, far, as far as the repetitions uh, uh, are concerned, so uh, acts of violence that uh, repeats itself. As far as I'm concerned, we don't have specific data on the number of uh, cases that are repeated uh, in uh, uh, the different contexts. But unfortunately, we do not have enough uh, uh, data to tell you. Well, I hope I was uh, clear enough, uh, but that's what I had to tell you. Thank you. Uh, any question, don't uh, hesitate. You have my email address, you have my uh, phone number, so we can uh, get in touch. Uh, no worries about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. And then I pass on to Brigitte, as you also got a, a direct question. Yes, thank you. Uh, very briefly, so on the level of compensation, I don't have specific figures. Uh, it will be very dependent, I think, on the cases. But if there is an interest, I can I can inquire with our with our members um, on the side of the cooperation with police forces. We have had, unfortunately, also in the public transport network, these terrorist attacks. And since then, um, there is a much closer uh, cooperation in the bigger networks. Obviously, uh, sometimes also the operational centers which are in charge of surveillance of the network are shared between the operator and police forces, so that there is um, a very close contact. But obviously, we're speaking here about major um, uh, uh, attacks, major um, uh, occurrences. Um, in the field of uh, incivilities, which, which is, uh, I think, more the type of, um, uh, of violence that we are currently looking at, um, uh, it is obviously much more difficult to, to get to this uh, common understanding and to, and to have a quick, uh, a quick response from the side of the police forces and obviously also from the justice institutions because we need, we need both, uh, in fact. So these are certainly uh, still areas um, where we have to, to work, maybe also with you, because I suppose that also in, in your sectors, sometimes a quick uh, intervention and a quick punishment appropriate, nothing, but, but just, just to show offenders that, they're not, uh, that they cannot do whatever they want, just to, to put barriers. Um, and I, I think that's, that's certainly something that um, uh, uh, we should maybe also work on um, uh, together. 
on yes on on CCTV maybe yeah, we have also this camera so these recordings uh, but there as um, as Susan said um, there are obviously all the um, uh, privacy laws so um, uh, you have to have a specific habilitation in fact to be to, to have the authorization to look at these recordings so normally this is also the police forces that would come to the operator and say there has been this and this uh, please show me what has happened in this station at what, whatever hour. Um, but uh, yeah, but normally the operator cannot um, use those um, those recordings. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Brigitte. And um, we had the other question that Tore brought up was uh, whether indeed uh, the the, uh, the impact of COVID nineteen. Um, and uh, obviously, whether we're only seeing the the tip of the the iceberg here, which surely is due to the to the reporting, of course, and we're, we're aware that it is very very difficult to report these cases um, of of third third party violence. But is anybody of the speakers who would like to reply to to take that up? That question from Mitora. Brigitte, you want yeah, to maybe maybe in, in our sector one of the elements was also that um, the um, for example the, the bus drivers um, had to remind people to put on their masks so uh, they had a role uh, in implementing or in, in checking these um, these measures and I think this um, this has been abandoned after uh, in, in many networks in fact um, afterwards. Uh, because because it led to to really higher levels of um, of uh, um, of violence, and I think it's the same in in in, uh, in supermarkets and so on, where staff asked um, people not wearing a mask to to do it. So uh, it it was mainly linked also to these uh, type of um, of roles that, in in the end, are not the role of a driver. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for that, um, uh, Brigitte, for that reply. Um, so, colleagues, um, I'm a bit in a dilemma as a chair. I've chaired terribly badly concerning the time allocation that we have. So, um, we're supposed to have a debate on the effectiveness of the multi sectoral social partners guidelines and uh, the areas for improvement now. Um, we, the interpreters kind we have offered us that we can go a bit beyond the timing, but I'm also conscious that we have been working together here um, uh, for uh, nearly two and a half hours without a break, so I don't want to take us too far beyond our time. What I suggest we do is I give the floor to Jane to introduce the topic, but knowing that we will not have a full debate on this now. Um, and rather take this debate then into the upcoming events that uh, we're going to have um, uh, following this, this seminar, um, this webinar in, in the project. Um, what I do want to um, give to you now, um, just to be, bear that in mind, are the questions also for this, for this session that we had foreseen um, for discussion. And the two questions are, to what extent have the guidelines provided useful um, uh, support to, to step up for the protection and compensation of victims of violence and harassment? And the other question we had was, do you think that um, the guidelines should be updated uh, and include a reference to sanctions against perpetrators of violence and harassment. And there are a couple of things that have issued uh, or come out of the, the, um, the presentations we had earlier that we might want to refer to here. Um, but I first, I first give the floor now to Jane to introduce um, or yeah, this, this uh, debate. Um, and um, uh, then we'll see how much time we can um, dedicate to a short discussion. Jane. Yeah, um, it's been a really, really interesting discussion. So I wouldn't be too worried about badly chairing at all, Susan, because it's been so interesting and it's been good to have the time to have these examples. Um, I'm just putting up my last slide here again because we thought this might 
just be another prompt to help with the discussion um, about the kind of remedies, protections, compensation initiatives, and indeed sanctions that um, may be relevant for the updating of the guidelines. And, you know, I, I didn't really have the time to cover this in detail when I was doing my presentation earlier. But I think there's lots of really innovative um, things that we're picking up on in the project, um, including, and I think a very nice example from some of the countries that have quite good legislation on well-being at work, um, have also implemented a system of having, you know, um, in the workplace, confidential advisors, advocates who are able to talk confidentially to somebody about a, a problem with violence and harassment and perhaps guide them in terms of how they can seek a remedy. Um, and I think the example, Ale Alexandra's example from Italy is, is just fantastic. I think the work that's been done in the so-called mobbing counters, I think as they're, they're often known, is, is really exemplary in terms of trade unions providing structures for support, um, legal advice and so on. So we only have about five minutes, but uh, I think we should be opening the floor now. And Nadja, I don't know if you wanted to add something as well, because I know you had a few suggestions and ideas as well in terms of feeding into the um, revision, potential revision of the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And then I pass directly on to Nadia then. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Suzanne. And uh, indeed, your chairing, chairing was very good and it was great to have uh, yeah, more detailed presentations anyhow. And we have more time and the, pro the project will end, uh, well, next year in, at the end of January. So not to worry about, um, about lack of time regarding the review of the guidelines. And in fact, each time we, we've tried at every webinar to, to get uh, delegates inputs into uh, yeah, in, into a possible revision of the content uh, of the guidelines. And every time it's at the end of the webinar and we run out of time. So <laughs> on that one, what we are going to do is that we have two more webinars to, to go. Uh, also bearing in mind that Brigitte Ollier uh, would like us also to discuss in more details the impact of COVID-19, uh, but we will integrate, uh, we will have some space, you know, more in-depth discussions on the possible review of, of the guidelines uh, in the in the next couple of months. But obviously, I think we already have partly some answers uh, stemming from uh, Jane's um, excellent um, research uh, findings. I mean, e excellent in, in that we are really, I think, getting to really to the meat of, of, of the discussion here. But Jane just told us earlier on that 70% of the respondents to the survey had little or no awareness of the guidelines. So I think it, it says it all in terms of which impact the guidelines might have had at national level. Having said that, there are still 30% of respondents who, who know the guidelines and hopefully who have used the guidelines, but clearly there is um, uh, an implementation gap huh, that we will need to, to address um, uh, as part of the review uh, of the guidelines. And again, in Jane's presentation, we have already some useful pointers as to what we could be doing uh, if we decide to revise the guidelines. Um, including the nature of the guidelines. Uh, you, you also, we also had figures that to make them uh, legally binding could be uh, an option uh, and could be part of the explanation why the guidelines have not been, um, well, have been very poorly uh, implemented. And, um, but there is also other, other questions on gender-based violence comes back and that <clears throat> perhaps needs to be more you know, put to the front. Um, the issue of training, I think, uh, raising awareness, exchange of good practices, uh, but then maybe we need to agree, when I say we, trade unions and employers, to agree on uh, how, you know, a checklist on what, what, what is a good practice, what is a good policy, and in our view, in our view obviously, this has to be sustainable uh, over the time, for instance. And the issue of external, internal violence also, uh, I think that's part of the questions we need to address. Our guidelines deal with third party violence, external mm -hmm. violence. 
And we have seen in relation to digitalization that the two internal and external are really intertwined. Um, so anyway, I think we have a lot, you know, a lot of food for, for thought. And but regarding, again, uh, compensation and sanctions, <clears throat> I think we, one of the key takeaways from Jane's uh, findings is also what the European Court of Justice says, that there can be no fixed, fixed amount of compensation. And that's an important one also to, to, keep, to keep in mind. And of course, again, I cannot stress enough that what we need is to prevent violence. But when, when violence arises, the victims must be compensated and uh, supported, of course, and can go back to work. Uh, but there is also a financial issue, which is here. Um, so, so at least I, I thought that was interesting. I mean, I didn't know that, that there was a, a you know, European case law already. So I think we need to keep that in mind. The guidelines do not provide for detailed, details at all no, on compensation, um, sanctions. But again, I think Jane's presentation was useful in summing up what we can find in other directives, anti-discrimination directives, specific directives dealing with gender equality. So I think that's, again, very useful for us in a, when we discuss possible um, review revisions uh, of the guidelines. So, and yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so. th thank you, Nadia. Thank you very much. I think actually that was a very good summary. <laughs> <laughs> um, of uh, um, uh, and for you know um, yeah for this for this uh, session that we had today, um, I understand that also from previous sessions um, some of the things that uh, arose that should be included maybe um, uh, in in such an update of the guidelines is the the need for a quick uh, response and I think we also heard that that earlier. Uh, quick to intervene, intervene quickly, um, but also an issue regarding the length of the procedures. As I I understand that they are they are indeed very lengthy because there are of course uh, all the different procedures that have to be that have to re be respected, but also the need indeed for as you said also for a holistic approach, um, and uh, the need for the the, the psychological um, support indeed as you as you said and the the aspect of the the Absolutely, the, the core aspect here must be at all times that we're talking about the prevention, the prevention of this happening at all. But if it happens, then it's important to have those uh, compensation uh, measures and the, and the sanction measures in place. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, colleagues, with that, what, what I will do here is I, I, will, I will conclude our meeting. Um, by um, saying that indeed, as we just heard Nadia also um, refer to, there will be uh, more meetings um, coming up uh, in the frame of this project. Um, and you are, of course, warmly um, uh, invited to participate in these. There will be separate um, trade union and unemployer discussions as a follow up of these webinars. And then more specific um, sectoral um, uh, discussions or, or focused um, sessions. So uh, we hope to see you there. And what I would like to do now then is to thank you all very much for participating in this um, webinar, for having been with us, um, and I hope having learned and taken away good practices and interesting insights um, also for you in your work uh, that you're doing uh, back home in your, in your organizations, in your work. Um, I would like to thank EPSO, Nadia, I would like to thank you in particular for um, giving also ETUCE the opportunity to chair this meeting um, as we're in, in, a, in a joint, in a joint um, uh, um, uh, cooperation here. I would like to thank also our interpreters in particular. You have allowed us to understand each other and uh, be able to uh, learn from each other. So thank you very much. And... Uh, yeah, I'll end with here with a big thank you to our speakers as well, Jane. It's been a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Thank you very much also for accompanying this project. It's very valuable support and input to this. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you soon. Uh, Nadia, sorry. I do, uh, no, that's an uh, uploading. Okay, then thank you very much. And uh, 
Um, see you soon. <laughs> and stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.